Kingdom. Aleichem Shalom. Baruch Haba. Bank, Shem Bank. Taira Frank, Shalom Aleichem. Family, friends, Facebook, pastors by. Uh, welcome to today's episode of a rabbi and, uh, and an ethnomusicologist slash klezmer. I walk into a Zoom and I'm delighted to be here with my chaver, um, Liesl. Uh, Slapovich, and I'm in, going to be sharing this link on uh, our, a bunch of different mediums, but people should be able to access it now on um, on my Facebook page and later on YouTube. But to begin, um, Rib Ziesel, um, yeah. <laughs> why don't you tell us what what is ethnomusicology for those of us at home who may not know? Right, let's start with the most burning issues. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you know, uh, I think it was there was um, a brilliant article. I can't without Googling right now because it was pr probably 20 years ago um, that, you know, probably in the ethnomusicology journal, maybe Asian music journal. Uh, why is ethnomusicology not a musicology? Mm. So, uh, or why? Why is the what does that prefix "ethno" stand for? Mm -hmm. It's not. Um, it's interesting, really. Uh, it's not really about the prefix. It's not about ethno or ethnos. Uh, ethnomusicology is basically a method of um, you know it's cultural anthropology. Uh, that's what it is. A musical cultural anthropology. Uh, so uh, an ethnomusicologist can effectively study um, music of Mozart, for example, or really any um, uh, music or sound making of uh, any group uh, on this planet, any human group. So it studies human uh, sound making and noise making, music making activities, regardless of how they are perceived in a given society or group. So the biggest uh, distinction there is that Ethnomusicology studies the um, act of performance and the societal aspect of it, uh, rather than uh, purely what's on the page, what was written. So here we, I, I totally, you know, I'm fully aware that we can go into the can of worms here about w what written tradition stands for, or how, uh, you know, significant. Uh, signifying it is for what's actually stands behind it or how mnemonic it is um, because written traditions exist in many music cultures of the world right um, including Jewish um, we hope we have Tamea Mikra in Torah uh, including Indian classical music uh, with, and it's also mnemonic there um, and, uh, you know, and so, so ethnomusicology studies the actual live performance and everything that precedes it, everything that happens during it, or everything that conditions it, and everything that uh, is the aftermath of it mm. that surrounds it. So all, in all of its context, it's a living culture. So who's ethno? Which, which, which people's ethno are you, is your so, so, expertise? So, so, well, so, so that's... Now, so part of the answer is that I answered, you know, as I said before, it's not really about a given ethno. Right. Ethnos, uh, it's a method. Um, and um, I've had some uh, experience uh, or experiments also studying also classical music performances from that perspective. And, you know, it totally works. Uh, but yes, to answer your question... Um, it you know I have been focusing my entire con you know, conscious life on Jewish music, mm -hmm. uh, and um, it's it's been a very personal experience as well as it is for many um, scholars uh, and and many performing musicians, uh, you know, uh, and many composers I should say as well. Uh, basically, you know, um, 
it's not my super unique or original observation, but my observation as well, that you know, as a scholar, as, as a composer, as a performer, we stick to kind of one mega theme and you know and we we basically play ourselves mm. uh, you know in theater as actors as well i'm sure many actors will agree no matter what roles we are assigned um we still you know we it's about preservation of your integrity mm-hmm. i believe you know you still have to have that um underlying that um layer mm-hmm. that carries that that brings authenticity to what you do so uh, you know, having um, been raised, uh, having been born and raised originally in the Soviet Union, in the kind of late late Soviet Union, uh, but still was quite Soviet. You know, um, in it was not it was more vegetarian. You know, <laughs> not as not in nineteen thirties, but yeah. still it was quite Soviet. And and so so I I was totally unaware uh, first that I was. Jewish or mm. whatever that meant, who who I was, like, mm. like who really was I? Question. Uh, I probably first heard the that word Jew when I was four or five years old. I think from my parents, so they told me that I was Jewish. Obviously, it meant nothing to me, except that I learned the word. Okay. What was the context in which they told you? Do you remember? Uh, I can't well? remember. It was just just some casual conversation. Yeah. Um, you know, in our living room, and something just came up. You know, I was four or five years old, so I, right. I can't really remember the exact uh, situation. So it was not nothing negative or explicitly positive. It was just a, some something I asked, or you know, maybe I heard that word. What goes uh, on the password? Was, right. So so you know, then then there was a few. And so I don't need to spend any significant chunk of time here to tell that there was uh, all levels of anti-Semitism in the Soviet Union, institutional, household, you know, uh, any, like, you know, from your neighbor to any boss to any academic institution. My, you know, my, um, my aunt, for example, she's an academic, she's a psychologist. And she was told in her face, uh, you know, derogatory, using derogatory terms, that you know the Jewish Slapovich will not study here when she was going to grad school, and she went to Moscow, which surprisingly was much more uh, liberal wow. than Minsk, um, you know, Belarus, Belarusian Soviet Socialist Republic that was holier than thou in um, in these aspects. Yeah, uh, you know, being so subservient to Moscow, kind of KGB or whatever. Um, that ideology. Uh, so, and you know, my my parents also experienced that. My teacher, late Professor Nina Stepanskaya Le Sholem, uh, she had actually uh, a Jewish diary as a student and a grad student, uh, in which she was just writing down because she had no one to share, you know, except her parents and mm-hmm. her sister. She was uh, writing down all the um, injustice. Um, that she was experiencing uh, because of being Jewish there. Mm. So, you know, although we were kind of deprived of, um, you know, studying, openly studying our culture and, you know, openly going for, uh, you know, my, my first experience, maybe I'm ju- jumping all the places around, but just trying to give a wider context. Sure. Um, my first experience as a Jewish ethnomusicologist, and ethnomusic- there's no such thing as Jewish ethnomusicologist, that's wrong. But ethnomusicologist dealing with Jewish material, uh, right? So I was in my second year, so I was a sophomore in the conservatory in Acad- 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 Belarusian State Academy of Music. And uh, fortunately, we had enough. Sorry, of- Zizu, let me in- hold on, let me interrupt you. Did you what, when did you start playing what instrument? Okay, so now I'll As you play that, that. So, but yeah, I will remember that. So, so okay. I started um, piano at six. Um, um, my, my father brought me to music school. We had piano uh, in my grandparents' house, which was a trophy piano that I believe my great grandfather, who was also a clarinetist, brought from Germany as a trophy instrument, maybe or whatever the maybe they bought it. I, I don't believe he brought it himself because he was very sick. He was prisoner of war, uh, mm-hmm. and he came back in 1919, December of 1919, back. So anyway, so they had a trophy piano, a beautifully ornated, um, but it was you no, know, it, it wasn't a good instrument as such. Okay. 
anyway, so I studied, I, st I started my studies on that instrument. Uh, and um, I picked up clarinet when I was 13. Um, it was no um, specific reason for choosing the clarinet. It was not the Jewish music or klezmer or whatever. It was uh, my, um, one of my childhood dreams were, you know, to become a or orchestral conductor. And uh, I thought that because I was just playing piano, I wanted to study one of the actual orchestral instruments. And I wanted to study oboe, but then in my first music school, there was no oboe teacher. So mm -hmm. there was a clarinet teacher instead. So, so I took clarinet. Um, that was the story. I was 13. So, so these are the instruments. And then, then I picked up, and then I, as I moved on um, to the special music school, uh, the National Music, now called National Music College, which is not college in American terms, but it's a more of a pre-college. Um, I went on also with harpsichord and organ. And music, musicology became my uh, major. Okay. So that's the story. So uh, going back to that story, you know, when I was in second year at conservatory, um, one of my professors, Tamara Yekimenko, a notable researcher of Belarusian music, uh, you know, I, I was about, well, she recommended me for my term paper uh, to uh, look at a collection uh, that was preserved, a small collection of 20 Jewish songs, Yiddish songs, that were preserved in the you know, folk music cabinet there at the conservatory. And uh, that was collected by uh, Bela Agranovska, then, um, I mean, not then, but much earlier student there. So she recorded this 20 songs from a Jewish woman uh, somewhere in Belarus. I can't uh, remember. It was either Bobruisk or Borisov. I, no, it was not in Minsk. Anyway, so she sang those 20 songs, some actually even in Loshan Kodesh in Hebrew, Aramaic, Alena uh, Derech, um, and uh, some, some really interesting stuff there even like looking back from today's perspective. Um, and so, so I would just write something about it, you know, for, it's not a big deal, it's a term paper. Right. Uh, you know, just, and then I realized that I don't understand Yiddish. Uh, no, so, uh, but that, that's not the point here. The point is that that woman was not allowed to use that as her diploma project. Mm. She went on, she recorded, uh, and that collection was preserved. But she had to switch her, uh, you know, theme uh, to something Shostakovich. You know, Shostakovich was uh, a much adored figure among, in general, Jewish. Uh, no, in, sorry, in general, Soviet intelligentsia, musical circles, and far beyond musical circles. You know, because he, he was he was a mensch. He was a uh, he always stood up to the system as much as he was himself mm -hmm. scared and terrified by it. And he, you know, he did quite a few, uh, you know, heroic, I, I would, it's not an exaggeration, uh, heroic things, protecting a lot of his, his Jewish friends and students, you know, calling up KGB office to release uh, um, uh, Moisei Weinberg, who's an immigrant from Poland, you know, and telling them, like, please don't torture him too badly, he has a, you know, he has a weak heart. Him, um, you know, and you know that, that cost him a lot. He, that could cost him much more than you know. So, mm -hmm. so he, he was. So Shostakovich was a kind of a, uh, you know, a Rue Platz, and as he is called in Yiddish, a resting place or a refuge. Yeah. And uh, so, so if if a student was not allowed to write a diploma on Jewish theme in 1980, uh, probably that was that would be my guess that what she would have done, and that's what right. she did to write something on, I don't know. Shostakovich related. Anyway, so I went on and I realized I didn't speak Yiddish. I uh, didn't understand what she was saying. You know, maybe a few words here and there, um, but and my mom is a Yiddish passive Yiddish speaker, and Yiddish was spoken in the family. But and my grandfather, you know, Yanka Lidelchik was a Yiddish poet who had been published before the war. But you know, in, as a matter of fact, um, as a matter of fact, so she. Recommended my my grandfather was um, not with us anymore at that point, so uh, I went to his friend from 1930s who was the last Yiddish poet and author Hirsch Reles in um, Minsk. Wow! You know, and they went to school together. The uh, and um, he helped me, and not only he helped me to translate all those 20 texts, but also he sang. So that was my first field work, my first expedition. He sang a few songs from his native. Uh, shtetl of Chashnik in the Vitebsk Oblast. Wow. He was a son of a rabbi. He was a zer ivredik, as they say in Yiddish. Yeah. He was really, really literate. 
uh, you know, and, uh, and so he sang a few songs that, that I that became eventually became part of my repertoire as a performer. I find it's so powerful that your first, um, you know, excursion into this work took you, you know, you found your way back to your, Z, you know, your Z, sort of Zeda's um, milieu, you know, a friend of your grandfather's. Yeah, that was very symbolic. Yeah. I felt um, that support, you know, really. And I will tell you more, so, you know, when I went on with studying Yiddish, um, I actually, I, I was channeling Hirsch says, I know I kind of remembered my, my Zeta's voice, but uh, I didn't hear him speak Yiddish a lot. I mean, they spoke Yiddish between themselves and my grandmother, but not to me, obviously. Yeah. Maybe a few few words here and there. Uh, so I kind of was channeling Hirsch Reles's voice and accent. So mm -hmm. when I was started speaking Yiddish, you know, that Litvish uh, accent that he had, it was it seemed to me it was very close to that of my grandfather. Mm -hmm. Uh, with a few kind of notable exceptions, you know, that north northeastern w instead of l, uh, mm -hmm. that's very typical, and also, you know, yingewe, uh, he would say, not a yingele, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but it's a very specific kind of dialect-related um, thing. Anyway, so it helped me, you know, and uh, I think it worked, yeah. Um, and, and from there discovered klezmer music as well? Well, that's a different story. Uh, it is related, but it's a different story. So just to finish that thing, Please. all my uh, all my term papers and my diploma and then my PhD dissertation were all on Jewish music. Wow. So every topic, you 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 name it, music musical analysis, uh, history of Russian music, history of Western music, um, and so on, and history of uh, Belarusian music, polyphony, uh, all all these themes. Um, the history of orchestral styles. I found something that was Jewish related and I wrote every single term paper on a Jewish topic and I still have them all in my computer from that time. Uh, there was absolutely something to say and something to research, even for me as a young you know, student, undergrad student at the time. Sure. Uh, I was so excited about discovering uh, my identity, but also in such a meaningful way that there's such a wealth, such a treasure trove sitting right. around. And I live, I still was still living in the place where everything was happening. The right. culture there was uh, thick, was rich between the, you know, between the two world wars. It was, you know, there was a Yiddish ballet, there was a Yiddish opera uh, written by Mikhail Kroshner, who died in Minsk ghetto in 1943. Mm -hmm. It was totally unresearched. There was so much happening there, you know, so I felt, wow, I like, right. yeah, I, I'm so lucky that I'm here and it's not the easiest place to be, but. Can I know. just uh, interrupt you there? Absolutely, so what, absolutely. What did it feel like? Because here you were like on this, you know, excursion, this, this treasure, like discovering this treasure trove of material, but you talked about the way that you were raised and obviously the political, you know, parameters of, uh, and, uh, and suffocation of, uh, of, of Jewish life. So what did that feel like? And Bashas, as you were, you know, going through these materials, discovering these materials in some of the very places where they once lived? Well, I mean, it felt, uh, you know, as a huge gift, you know, as a big privilege that I could do it. I was, uh, honestly, I was on the fence. I was about to, I, sub I, I submitted my documents to UCLA and I was pondering to go to UCLA. I was seriously pondering, even more seriously, to go to St. Petersburg Conservatory, which is one, one of the main destinations, a, a, along with Moscow Conservatory for our special music school graduates. Um, um, you know, there's a really serious music education there and the yeah. musical community, scholarly academic community there. And uh, it was my very uneasy and conscious decision to stay in Minsk because I had my teacher already, you know, with the Nina uh, Stepanska, who was first my um, for first met her when I was in the ninth or tenth grade in the, in the high school, and we continued all the way through um, my PhD dissertation uh, project, and uh, of course the wealth of this material, archives, and still people who were alive, and we went right. on for a decade to record um, over a decade to record people, you know, so that collection that we created. Right. So, so that was a conscious, it was an uneasy decision because I understood very clearly what I was losing. Uh, I was losing, you know, build, build, building that precious network, um, mm -hmm. uh, which when I moved to the United States in 2008, I had to start from literally from nothing, from scratch. 
uh, to starting establishing and start talking about myself, my uh, research, and it w- was not easy. Now, when it came in when you were 30, uh, it's not nothing like when you're 18. Right. It's very, it's very different. Um, but on the other hand, it's not like if you're 50. So uh, sure. it was kind of still a doable. Um, but it also felt like a fresh air, like, oh, I discovered that. I really, I didn't know what to do. Uh, when I was, you know, entered my adolescence, you know, some of my classmates also started discovering their spirituality and uh, we started att- att- attending some Baptist church meetings. Uh, I was like, starting reading Bible and uh, I was also uh, always been a language nerd and all, all my concert tours, I started touring when I was 12 years old with mm-hmm. a Jewish group. So that will be an answer to your other question about okay. Klezmer. Um, you know, so uh, I brought the Bibles in all the languages, the European languages. I was in Finnish and Swedish, you know, I was just picking languages like, like that. Uh, it was easy and it was kind of doable. I, I'm thankful. To, of How course, many languages yeah. do you speak? In, uh... Actively, I, I would say now um, seven maybe, uh, but I, mean, I was always counting about 12 because I can... Uh, and then it, it really depends on what are you fluent in, in what you can understand reading what you can explain yourself in just a few words a basic uh, fluency uh, proficiency so it, yeah. it really d- differs but you no know, uh, so this is a lot of basically germanic slavic languages uh, some uh, obviously italian for you know musical terms and uh, operas i learned a lot from the opera scores just wow. reading because there's a a translation uh, it was a russian and as i say german russian italian mm-hmm. so you, uh, inevitably you learn to pick up some language from there but also concert tours as you try to sure. i was always wanting to kind of um blend in to be recognized as um not as an alien mm. uh, even if i was spe- i had to spend you know a month or two uh, on tour somewhere in some country mm. it was always my uh, gut feeling my intention i don't know why Right, you have a chameleon type of uh, vibe of being able to pick up so, so much from so many different places. Yeah, I, yeah, and I had a I had a complex about that. So, so like, am I nobody? Am I being right? Like, and right. then I went in 2010 already here in America. I went to Brandeis University as a community educator, and then I was artist in residence at the BIMA and sure. uh, Genesis program there. And uh, and my first year there, um, uh, one of my students told me. Ziesel, you you jam with people so well, and I said that's the answer. Right. That's exactly my intention. I want to mm-hmm. jam with people. I mm-hmm. want to kind of, you know, be myself. Yeah. But also kind of be I don't know what do you call it pleasant to people. Be yeah. part of part of it and learn in that way more. Yeah. I don't know. It's very it's very. Uh, you. Very kind of I mean, lower, lower you do level. it so well. You do it so well, and you speak so fast that I think people, they, they forget that it's actually like, it's, it's a stroke of genius. <laughs> the you yourself probably overlooked. No, because it comes oh God, from of my parents, you know, who... yeah, yeah, but of course, you know, it's, but, but it comes so naturally to, to you, but hold on, let's go back to, of to course, yeah. no, let's go back yeah, to Klezmer uh, music. What, yeah, what, so... Yeah. Okay. So, um, so we were, first of all, in 1991, my sister, uh, who is uh, six years younger than me, and I, that later me, we joined a Jewish choir. So, uh, um, you know, a woman named Elizaveta Haskina, um, she came back to Minsk. She was originally from Minsk, but she was a wife of a military officer who was uh, de- deployed in Kazakhstan for many years. So she came back to Minsk, and she started that Jewish group, which was already sort of allowed you know it was not forbidden it was 1990 1991 wow. uh, i think it was still 1990 so um uh, and then my sister joined and she started teaching at the same music school where we both went uh and then she invited me so of course we were starting so the same uh person the same writer here Shrelis, helped them because there's so few you know literal literate people around and um so he helped with some yiddish songs and we sang some hebrew songs israeli songs and we went on a month and a half tour in Finland very soon. So I was 12 years old. Uh, wow. I was singing uh, songs like I like I was reading some syllables. So I barely under, I mean, I understood what they meant, but I didn't speak the language. So it was very new experience. Uh, I wasn't a klezmer or anything. So I, I, I said, often pre-pitching, brenta fire, all this kind of stuff. Or, mm-hmm. Yerushalayim shel zahav. You know, 
or you know whatever it's and that's and that's and that's and the when I when I worked here a couple of years in Camp Kindering uh, and I knew all this Israeli songs and uh, and Yiddish songs of course and uh, so um, and you know my, my colleagues were like were, wow how do you know them well there's a history to that so right. that came really handy and I started arranging a lot of the songs as we started forming an instrumental group when my voice started changing and mm-hmm. that kind of all uh, that group um, moved on to being a more of a girls women's choir which was also dancing so I formed an instrumental group and I started writing arrangements for the choir and the group that's you know that was a great practical opportunity for me to really learn as you know on the job right uh, you know and so uh, th- eventually you know I started exploring Yiddish song through that we got some so Nechama uh, Lifshitzaita's daughter gave um, uh, Elizabeth Haskin, I think, uh, the book uh, from the Copenhagen um, choir Hazamir from 1937. Uh, it was a lot of choral arrangements there, really good arrangements. Um, so by different uh, authors, by Berezovsky, I think by Kopit, uh, Kopit no, all the Jewish, Russian Jewish mostly, but not only uh, composers and ethnomusicologists, uh, of the early 20th century uh, and I started writing that and also in 1993 my, my dad who's a linguist and uh, as a English professor to, to this day in Minsk he went as a chaperone of a Chernobyl children well that's another to- topic Chernobyl uh, and also Chernobyl and Klezmer um, which I'll talk in about in a, in a second he went to Holland and um, he bought there a cassette of klezmer music so mm-hmm. that was total novelty to me he brought wow. it it was i remember i literally a month ago i found that musician on facebook marcel salomon salomon mm-hmm. klezmorim and theo Fantol on the accordion and that was a revolution how old were you i was uh 15. Mm-hmm. i was 15. so there was a revolution i used that in my several academic presentations and in conservatory at conservator and professors students everybody went crazy like they felt in love with that that music yeah. that I used just as samples my first um, presentation academic uh, paper Wow uh, you know and um, correct me if I'm wrong but I feel like you know today especially in the States this type of research we would take for granted whereas when you were doing it it was uh, I can't imagine that there were many people in your community that were we're diving into this, uh, the, you know, this material and this type yeah, of way. Yeah, you're absolutely right. When I, yeah. you know, when I, when I, I, I mean, in the course of all these years, of course, I was aware that America and specifically New York are big centers of um, Jewish culture, of right. Yiddish culture, of klezmer music. And thanks to my some of my friends and colleagues, I was getting some books and the recordings. So I was not, it, it was a really a privilege to, because otherwise it wasn't possible even when Amazon started. I, you know, we didn't have those credit cards that I could sure. even use if I, even if I had the money to buy all yeah. that. So I had some um, donors uh, who helped me get those recordings. So I'm really thankful and uh, to them. But anyway, yes, I was, when I came here, that's exactly what you're saying. What happened when I came from, when it was totally under, underrepresented culture there to, to a place where it is oversaturated right. with it. Right. Uh, and I was sort of prepared, but not fully, because you have, it's, experi- it's a, an experiential thing. Right. So you tell us about the Chernobyl. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Oh. I'm sorry? No, we, we finished what you were going to say. No, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm saying it was a total contrast from a, right. like a contrast shower. Obviously, it was Europe, which I toured so many times, which is right. something in between. There was a resurgence of, uh, you know, Jewish culture in Poland, in Germany, in the Netherlands. Yes. And, and, and you know, I went, uh, went to England to Jewish Music Festival in 2000. Uh, so I, I saw that something was happening. Right. There, but here you know, in New York, it was like, oh, right. on all levels and everything. Like, right. oh, there's so much Yiddish theater, klezmer, right. this, that, synagogues. And uh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, um, I want to come back to that, but first uh, that that to that contrast. But first, tell us the the, the Chernobyl Kle- the klezmer piece you were going to mention. Well, uh, the Chernobyl theme is that you know we're all children of Chernobyl. I'm not talking about Chernobyl dynasty of the rabbis, not Chernobyl yeah. Hasidism, not at all. I learned about that way later in my life. 
Um, unfortunately, you know, what I'm talking about is the, you know, the, the power plant uh, explosion in 1986. Uh, so, you know, th there's a lot of um, health issues and, you know, just as, and immediately and then in several waves as Japanese scientists predicted, there was a huge wave of cancer 30 years later and I believe that my professor Nina Stepanska died she, when she died, she died from cancer. Uh, maybe she was part of, I mean, she was affected by that. Mm. Uh, it was, really became an epidemic there. Mm. Um, you know, so um, with that group that I mentioned, that uh, the original choir, Grinning Kebemelech, uh, which was later renamed into the Jewish Music Youth uh, Ensemble Simcha, uh, we, a lot of our tours were charitable tours in uh, Western Europe uh that were you know the money was going to chernobyl children and you know wow. we saw that so the, those children were taken actually those money, the way that the money was used that they were taken to those countries for you know recuperation uh you know from medical direct medical help because some of them were already operated on they had this something you know these tubes you know inserted so they were like really sick children uh, to just uh, the opportunity to be in the fresh, uh, less contaminated air and eating uh, less contaminated uh, products, food, yeah. for several weeks. Even that would help. Uh, so, so we were working a lot on that. For us, it was something meaningful and also an opportunity to, to go out there to see Europe, but also to do it in a meaningful way and to tour. Uh, so it was, th yes, this was that, uh, you know. Um, so um yeah so 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 my, my 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 father brought me that cassette when he was a chaperone to the chernobyl children group and then i you know i went to the such tours and to sweden to finland to the netherlands to germany and yeah we raised probably millions of euros or whatever money was mm. there um wow. so i'm saying that, that that was kind of around us and we were all very aware of that and we were very fortunate we were not as sick or not that we were aware, aware of that at that time. You know, it was wow. nothing, nothing that bad, but it was always kind of around. That theme was always there. It was real. It was happening. Um, I, I, you know, I'm thinking about your the way you were just talking about ethnomusicology earlier, and but now, but now hearing you talk a little bit about the you know klezmer and 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 your work in klezmer, and it strikes me that you're like. You know, you're in between the worlds of you know the Torah Shabbatav and Torah Shabal Pev, like the written and oral traditions of of be of of both studying those traditions but also creating them anew. You know, uh, and I'd be curious if you talk a little bit about that dynamic of what it is of what it's like to be, you know, a modern ethnomusicologist but also an active performer and composer and educator and the like. Sure. Well. Uh, first of all, I don't, I don't consider my path to be unique. I think this is the way of, I mean, it was what it was because where I was born, but also like it was a, still a modern world and we we're moving on and, you know, in 1996, uh, I, you know, I got a laptop with internet, whatever, however slow it was at the time. So it, it wasn't like I was living in a cave or I was right. living in, you know, God forbid, in some North Korea. It was not that bad, you know. Um, However, you know it was so. So it you know, I'm as, as I'm as I'm observing the past of my colleagues of and fellow musicians uh, here in the United States and Canada elsewhere, and you know, I think that they're very close because we are all disconnected from the living tradition. If we're talking about klezmer, mm. and you know, I I did hear some Yiddish songs in my household, but. Uh, not as you know, not a lot of them. Okay. You know, so uh, we just like you know my call, my fellows here in the United States. I I learned that a lot of that tradition from old records. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I I got the old uh, out seventy eight round per minute records was that were issued in the Soviet Union. I digitized about hundred of them, mm -hmm. and I brought that. So it was one path, and also. Uh, American editions like you know Henry Sapoznik's uh, CDs that I got while being in Minsk, or you know, so there's editions of Natula Brandwine, of Dave Terrace, uh, you know of, uh, anything those serious uh, 
a wonderful series by Joel Rubin, um, the Yiches, the, the, the recordings from um, uh, Professor Schwartz's collection. Um, so, um, yeah, so, so I was studying, I was a distant, like a remote mm -hmm. student, you know, studying that from there. But then also we went uh, on together with uh, Dr. Stepanska to record, pe to meet people, uh, you know, which was also a huge stimulus for me to, um, uh, to study Yiddish. Mm. Because I realized very soon that if I addressed to them in Yiddish, whatever crippled my Yiddish was at the time, which I clearly see from those tapes, mm. it was still doing the, sh the, the shtick, the trick, you know, of opening up their memories in a completely different way. Right. They, you know, the people got astonished when they uh, heard a young man walk in and speak in a language they had not spoken for decades, and also a young person there. So that was like, wow, what's going on? There was so that, but so I'm saying, yeah, it was kind of different, but it was also typical in a way, you know, uh, that we, I, I, I didn't hear the klezmorim play in my town in the street. I didn't go and learn that traditional as an oral transmission. Right. However, to answer your question in full, you know, what is the modern ethnomusicologist? I think w one of the first answers to this question to me when I was a freshman at conservatory mm. and uh, one of my teachers and professors, Yelena Gorokhaldik, uh, who's an ethnomusicologist and indologist, uh, she, there was an ethno, international ethnomusicology conference held in, um, at our conservatory and she invited uh, Trang Quang Hai, um, who is um, a hereditary uh, Vietnamese court musician in five generations, but who escaped, defected from Vietnam when the communists wow. took over in 1972, uh, to Paris, where he is heading the uh, Institute of the uh, Institute de Recherche de l'Homme, uh, of uh, research of, uh, of, of human, human research, mm. and he was focusing on the study and performance of um, throat singing, Mongolian Tuvan throat singing, you know, like overtone wow. uh, harmonic throat singing, and he was playing all the traditional Vietnamese instruments as well, including, <laughs> not all of course, but some, and he brought in some spoons that he was playing on, and uh, so I, and, and, and at that time, you know, we're still in touch by Facebook with him, he's probably retired now, but then uh, he was an active member, I think he was a member of the board of ICTM, International Council for Traditional Music, which is a world's leading uh, organization uh, of the, the union of um, the guild of ethnomusicologists that has their the journal of ethnomusicology, ethnomusicology journal, uh, which really was a, my, one of my primary sources of information in, in the field. And uh, so he showed me the way that a serious academic, a serious researcher with a really established in this, uh, in his field is also a fantastic musician, a performing mm. musician mm. who really knows. And not only musician, he was also leading musical therapy sessions in Paris, wow. teaching people how uh, the throat singing that was actually curing them, mm. you know, and so that really opened up a whole much wider world that I had been imagining for myself, mm -hmm. what I could be doing in my life. Uh, and uh, then, you know, that world started expanding. Then I, in 2006, uh, for fast forward, well, I had met Michael Alpert, who is one of the luminaries of Yiddish uh, culture, re Yiddish revival, on, you know, as a dancer. I'm, I'm no, I know that you know, of course, yeah. Michael Meshke, but many of our listeners probably do not, might not know him. He's one, one of the key figures in the Yiddish revival from the 80s. Uh, as a multi-instrumentalist, dancer, ethno ethnomusicologist, uh, you know, Yiddish specialist, and many other aspects. And so, so I met him uh, in Saint Petersburg in 2004, and then in 2006 he brought me and uh, with as part of the then existent program East Meets West to Class Canada. Mm. Uh, so, uh, so I had the chance to meet many of my counterparts from many parts of the world, and mm. so that and but. Not only, so I was not only at Class Canada, and I was not really realizing. I also met my wife there, so it was a uh, future. Wow. Life. Yeah, we played some duets, and she played the cymbal, the dulcimer, uh, and I played the clarinet. But also, I went on our group that uh, from the former Soviet Union. We went on to the Ashkenaz festival. And it's funny. I just looked up uh, the obviously everything is virtual these days. Right. 
they're showing the kind of retrospective of uh, the footage and one of them on September 7th is going to be from the year when I was there for the first mm. time the all-star uh, klezmer tribute to German Goldenstein, who was another important figure in the klezmer community, um, coming from uh, Moldova, Ukraine. Um, anyway, so uh, I met uh, and I stayed with, referred by Zev Feldman, uh, I, uh, the you know, researcher and cymbal player and dancer. I stayed with Judith Cohen, a professor of, uh, uh, at York, York University and a notable ethnomusicologist uh, focusing on Sephardic Jewish culture. Um, and I spent several days with her, and uh, you know I, I was really impressed by the scope of her research. But mm -hmm. also I saw her and her daughter Tamar Ilan Cohen uh, being fantastic performers. I, mm -hmm. I attended their performance at Ashkenaz Festival. It was not on the main stage; it was some at some uh, community center there. But I went and I thought, "Wow, this is so incredible! It's so musical. It's like that's the top." level top-notch performance and there she's such a she and she's one of the most important researchers of mm -hmm. sephardic music mm. and i said yeah I, I should keep going i should keep it was always hard for me because mm. you know when i so ethnomusicology now and uh clarinet for example i never made clarinet an official part and so uh, a, a big uh no a terrible secret of polish <laughs> <laughs> i never i don't have any papers for clarinet mm. All my diplomas, every, all my papers, official stuff wow. is for musicology, ethnomusicology, pedagogy, all that, musical education. You know, so because I was offered, I was, I was religiously practicing clarinet together, like in the same space with all my classmates and right. high school and then a conservatory. So professors were observing that and some, several of them came up to me. I say we know that you're not part of the woodwind department. Do you want to maybe not switch or whatever you want to you know, or maybe combine? And I said honestly, I don't think that's feasible even because musicology is such a taxing uh, uh, major, even in high school. So like you know, the instrumentalists, for example, have their instrument major like class. They have chamber ensemble class, and they have orchestra class. Mm -hmm. These are three major, like the most like heaviest things they have to prepare for. And then they have general music history, general harmony, general this, general that. Now, I'm not saying that was easy, but the the requirements was much easier. Sure. And, for, and I had all my major subjects were, you know, Russian music, Belarusian music, Western music, polyphony, harmony, music theory, music analysis. That's six. Uh, and I had all the state exams for all of them. So, listen, I don't want to be master of all you know right. trades and jack uh, jack of all trades master of none i you know it, it could be a slippery slope i was very aware of that very wary of that mm -hmm. so but this i chose again I, I with a full understanding what i'm not getting there mm -hmm. uh to not switch or combine the majors uh, i would just you know we were working really really hard and the conservatory those exams were over the top we had to prepare you know 250 300 questions for each exam it was over the top so wow i was just i kept practicing honestly i kept touring i kept performing and so no so that's that's the there's the whole other question of how can one combine so combining going on tours and going back even if i spent say two two weeks three weeks on a tour what yeah. i missed i had to make up obviously you know, so it was so, always taxing, but it, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so what led you to 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 come to move to to move to New York? Well, formally and uh, you know, formally it was the marriage. So I got here on a fiance visa and I was not obviously planning because there's no easy way to move here. And and I just met somebody It was just clicked between us, you know, and wow uh, and we didn't have any chance to date traditionally yeah. we we obviously we had uh, skype with very finicky connection sure. uh at the time uh, you know dial up or whatever it was and we had icq chat but that was about it you know a couple times mariana my wife could come over to minsk which is also her hometown so she <laughs> came after 18 years to a very very different country wow it looked totally but you know so for me, it was a personal reason. 
But yeah. on the other hand, I was going to move somewhere. I was going to move. Well, I was a fellow at uh, Hebrew University uh, in 2004 as part of the from. I got a fellowship from the Sefer Center in Moscow, uh, so academic center for Jewish studies. That's my another very important community and the actual Sefer Center these days is celebrating its double bar mitzvah, its 26th anniversary. Wow. Uh, they're still active, part of Russian Academy of Sciences, uh, with Dr. Victoria Mochalova heading it now, and at the, at the time, uh, Dr. Rashid Kaplanov of blessed memory was the head of it. So that was a very, uh, my other a very important education in interdisciplinary Jewish studies and mm -hmm. how I learned many things Jewish. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, so, um, so, you know, so I, I was after my kind of association affiliation with the Hebrew University and meeting uh, Dr. Edwin Serusi, who was at the time director of uh, uh, Jewish Music Research Center there. Um, you know, I, I, I was off, not officially, but sort of offered the part time position. I was, it was not an offer. It was like, come here and we'll find you some part-time job here at, at the center and then was a conversation like that I think with Mikhail Lukin who was also working in the li music wow. library there so that that was it you know and uh, I was looking to Berlin I was looking to elsewhere even St. Petersburg or Moscow because it was really politically speaking so it, uh, it was not easy to stay in uh, in Minsk and I, I, that said I was very active I was producing uh, festivals Jewish music festivals there uh, I was doing really like everything. I believe everything I could. Mm. I have so many questions um, for you, but I, I, I'm wondering if you would talk for a moment because you're now a father. Yes. Yes. And you, the the for the forwards the forward recently covered a, a brilliant song of of yours that you that you wrote and performed with your daughter. And I'm just you're curious if you talk a little bit about what you know, being mindful of, you know, being raised in the Soviet, you in the former Soviet Union and the, the limitations to, to, to Jewish education and just this cultural Yerusha, you know, this inheritance. If you talk a little bit about now what it's like to, to be a father to your own children and being mindful of, of, of this legacy that, you know, that, that you carry. Sure. Um, well, I mean, obviously, I'm trying to give Dina, my daughter, everything that I could not be given um, by my parents because just they didn't have that knowledge or opportunity, and I was privileged to have it and learn it. So, uh, you know, so, so she, you know, I've been speaking Yiddish to her since she was born. Uh, she's not an active Yiddish speaker, but she speaks some Yiddish and understands a lot, mm -hmm. uh, being a trilingual child. But also, uh, with speaking a lot with her about, uh, you know, Jewish history, and again, something that I could not get as I was a child. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, trying to find the right doses of that, so she's not overwhelmed, of course. But sometimes, you know, just occasionally, we have these conversations as for a seven-year-old child. You know, yeah, something well, that's she... appropriate. Uh, but of course, you know, for for me, I was and the the. The more I grew up, and especially I started touring and seeing the world, going back to even even forget the specifically Jewish part of it, but in general the freedom um, to for personal expression, freedom for being who you are, yeah, who you, or even exploring if you don't want if you don't know who you yeah. are, but you want to explore who you might want to be, yeah. what yeah. resonates yeah. with your inner self, yeah. And I saw that uh, in Europe, which has mainly t touring, uh, people had uh, way more of those opportunities mm. there. You know, they were speaking freer, and there were it was a different attitude where a person, a human being, was more in the focus of the system that our system was, and and Belarus remained very Soviet in mm -hmm. these terms. Uh, um, and uh, although I mean, I have to give a fair credit uh, when I was in high school and grad school and uh, uh, undergrad and grad school and I came through my you know uh, observing uh, being an observant uh, Jew became part of my um, you know growing up and um, uh, so I, I, I was wearing a kippah you know a skull cap 
and I was uh, I asked really? to not yeah yeah for I was that was another um, quest because there were mm. also there was no kosher food in Minsk we I started going to the Litvish uh, synagogue Orthodox synagogue where we, there was a community of us of all people from all um, walks of life you know intelligentsia engineers workers who were just like me in all ages of life were discovering their identities and becoming Jewish. So that was a whole quest, how even to get the food that we could right. consume according to the Jewish dietary laws, the kashrus. Uh, so that, but, but... I didn't realize that that, dis that that was happening simultaneously for you as you yeah, were... Yeah, it was. It was a discovery. I, I know that that was the way for... Um, and then one of my heroes in Klezmer world, Andy Stadman, who became religious and became a rabbi, you know, and uh, so he came from a totally secular bluegrass music background. He's still a, he's still a top of the world bluegrass musician uh, and Klezmer musician. Uh, but I'm, I'm saying that for me it was natural because I wanted to be, uh, to keep that integrity and to explore that world in which I was diving as a performer and as an academic in its fullness and uh, also i mean it, it took more probably guts be, for me to do specifically being a jew rather than being for example a russian orthodox because a russian orthodox uh, or any christianity any religion was banned so people were also people who were researching that tradition they were you know also starting becoming observant and they're religious and I, so i was saying that but that that was kind of more institutionalized right. nationwide for me, it was more of a kind of a revolutionary step that, and then it's, so I'm, no, I'm not not saying it was a mile. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's not, it was something I had to do, but I'm saying that in general, that attitude in, is outside. So I was I was uh, um, allowed to wear keep. I was allowed to not go to to my lessons on uh, Saturday or Friday night. So we found ways with our dean. So he was very understanding, and I'm very grateful for that. You know. Uh, so there was like no real defiance of that. I feel but, like you know, the system was very different. The system was that I, you know, I, I every going back from uh, from a European tour back was very traumatic because for me because I had to switch back to a different modus operandi. Right. And you know, the human was not regarded as such a big value as I was seeing it elsewhere. I, you know, I feel. Dep depending on one's background, there's often a dichotomy in these, uh, the, you know, there's there's more walls in some of these worlds, you know, of being religious, exploring one's religiosity versus, you know, say more of the cultural. Uh, sometimes they're, they're, they're seen as mutually exclusive, but I, I, what I find so compelling about, you know, your story is, you know, it, it seems like there was just such a a thirst like almost a fit like a like um like a drought a thirst for for yiddishkeit in all of its ways um uh, that you were just eager to to soak up as much as you as you possibly could a, as okay. it related to your own professional and academic pursuits but also in your own you know spirituality and and becoming yeah you, you know you're, you're absolutely right i mean I, I was looking a little bit like a, you know um a black sheep um, right. There also also in the Jewish community, uh, I'm not saying anything bad. You know, I was contributing also together with my colleagues. We were con there was a small circle of us. We we're contributing as much as we could in terms of education. We we're leading yeah. all this, you know, lectures and concerts and everything we could share. But I was seeing that there was a little bit about being a black sheep. Like, why are you guys doing that? Right. Uh, because everybody is learning Hebrew and uh, repatriating to Israel. And I know I, I was always very you know, supportive of Israel and still am, you know, and uh, it's, a, you know, it's not a, you know, so it was yeah. never a question of choice for me. Yeah. But I'm saying, okay, no, I also, I'm learning Hebrew, I'm going to Ulpan, and I'm, but why should I not be learning my heritage language? You know, why should I not be learning what's here in this land where we were, we were nurtured? Right. Uh, we're, because this is the diaspora language and culture that is uh, so intertwined, it's so closely knit with with this land with this all these cultures we speak these languages you know we speak russian we speak belarusian polish whatever it's so informed by each other why why not why it's, it doesn't have to be mutually exclusive but still mm -hmm. and so so therefore of course because of this common ground uh there was when i started producing the street festivals and then the 
actual big festival we did the Klezmer Shock with uh, Gennady Schulman, who's a you know, former uh, show showman, uh, big kind of impresario in uh, Minsk. Uh, so there was a big wave of interest from from you know the general public, from the Belarusians, from the Russians, Poles, and you know the yeah. everybody, uh, in, including when you know the priests, including uh, students, including intelligence, everybody, because it 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 is the you know Yiddish culture as any diasporic culture has this great deal of common ground. Mm -hmm. You know you you know I I had oh I'm I'm, I'm I was not prepared for that. Um, I, I got uh, one of the C, one of the most important CDs, uh, Jewish music CDs. I got, gosh, um, it was uh, this guy from uh, who was ninety eight years old when he recorded that CD, uh, at the Isle of Jerba, uh, and so that was Jewish community at the Isle of Jerba, and there was a very specific Jewish Arabic dialect there, and he wow. performed, and that CD came out. I, I know that Lehman, um, I know uh, an imp very important research of Jewish music in the thirties went to Isle of Jerba and recorded him on metal discs and that book, a huge tome, was published after many years of fundraising by Hebrew University, uh, so Lehman's legacy, but also he was recorded in a Dutch, on a Dutch firm, a recording label in, when he was in his 90s, like in the early 98, and he was singing, for example, a Jewish Arabic song for circumcision, a Jewish Arabic song no. uh, for weddings, and he sang in, both in Jewish Arabic a dialect uh, or language and Arabic and he performed for Muslims and the Jews Amazing. his whole life on the Isle of Jerba and Jewish community does not exist there anymore Amazing. they all moved to Israel you know and that was a big kind of also insight for me yeah how, how closely connected can a Jewish culture be um, I'm realizing I have a million more questions for you and I'm mindful of the time too but I want to I will maybe I'll just ask you one or two more what what is you know the look you know you're in new york now yes so but i'm but and i'm and i'm just curious what it's like for you now and your thoughts and feelings around what you see going on in belarus right now um well i mean it, it really pains me to to see what's going on there it's not uh and not and it's not news to me it's not a novel yeah. you know it was expected uh no and if you don't know i, I i'm fully aware that might, a lot of people might not know. So there was an, another election, uh, you know, after 26 years of rule of one president, Lukashenko, and um, he, you know, pr claimed 80% uh, of the vote himself and was clearly very, very far from truth. So millions of people went out of the street, millions of people in the uh, country with 10 million uh, uh, population, Bafelkevum. <laughs> Total. So, so like really, really everybody, people from all backgrounds could not even go to sit at the same table before. They all went out, and they were brutally beaten by the police and special task forces. Some people were killed. Uh, press was attacked. So, you know, and uh, so, so it's a really bad situation, and it's not over. People, it's an 18th right. day today. The people keep coming out, going out. And police detains them. Yesterday, police locked people and uh, sent, you know, the big church in the center of Minsk. Uh, you know, they did not let a hundred people out of that church for hours. I mean, every was not just congregants, pre press, yeah. anybody, you know. So um, it, it, it's really terrible. And I feel, although I don't live there for twelve years, I feel connected. And you know, as I said, you know, Belarusian culture is closely connected to Yiddish, and it is part of me you know really yeah. and and it really pains me so i don't know what 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 can i do i can submit uh you know a song or any anything that can go out and can yeah. get the word out you know i can i wrote to my representatives i contacted congress uh so they can take any action you know um yeah i donated to the belarus charities that, and i'm encouraging other people to do that um, you know, there is a big pressure from, uh, and, and also Belarus being a uh, Russia's satellite in a way, right. in a big uh, sphere of interest and control. So it, it's really, um, it's really bad. And um, yeah. maybe afterwards I'll post, I don't know if people are, I haven't been looking at the chat, but we could have also post, you know, the video that you created. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. So where should, what's the, what's the best place for people to go, Zisil, to keep track of of your work, which I, you know, we're getting a sense of just how prolific and 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 it, it is, uh, you know. Well, 
I mean, if you, I'm, you know, I'll be happy if people, you know, s subscribe to my mailing list and might go to my w website, zislepovich.com, uh, Z-I-S-L-E-P-O-V-I-T-C-H.com, or, you know, follow me on Facebook, I have a page there, I'm on all social media, including YouTube, I'm posting my videos there, my klezmer band, Litvakos, uh, based here in New York, we also yeah. have all our social media, uh, so yeah, I mean, you know, we have Bandcamp, so support the artist, and uh, we are on, you know, on zieselbandcamp.com, litvakus.bandcamp.com. Um, yeah. Um, well, so we'll, and we'll post some of those links also afterwards. Thank you so much for coming on and, and sharing a little bit of around. your story. It's such a privilege to, to, to listen to you. Um, Thank you so much. To be continued. Yeah, to be continued. Okay. Zeigesund. Zeigesund und stark.